Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interview series with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period and revolutionary America. My name is Randy Flood, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Christian Despigna, author of Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, the American Revolution's Lost Hero. Now, this presentation is brought to you by in cooperation with the Real American Revolution and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. And this presentation will also appear on the YouTube channels of each. So, Christian, let's introduce our guest. Thanks, Randy. And we've been speaking with Vin Coretta, Professor Emeritus of English at the University of Maryland, about his groundbreaking biography about Phyllis Wheatley. And we wanted to ask a few follow up questions from our last discussion before we dive into Professor Coretta's other biography about Olauda Equiano, titled Equiano. The African. And Professor, we really appreciate you putting up with us for another round of questions. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> well, then, in our previous discussion about Phyllis Wheatley, we touched on her education a little bit, and we talked about her being a child prodigy. Let's revisit that for a moment and explain what happened when she arrived from America. Could she speak any English, and how did she progress so quickly? Well, what we know is that she arrived from Africa where she, she was kidnapped in Africa and when she was about seven years old. We know that because she was missing her front teeth when she arrived in Boston. She of course knew no, no English. She was born around 1753, arrived in Boston in 1761. And within four years, she was attempting to write poetry in English. That's that's when we have the first manuscript mm. poem by her. I mean, it's not very good, but, uh, <clears throat> and then she published her first poem in a newspaper just to, in 1767. So six years after she arrived in Austin and six years after she was first introduced to English, she was publishing poem, uh, poems in English. So that certainly qualifies her to me as a child prodigy. Uh, I, one of the things I did in researching her was, was to try to compare her education to that of some of her contemporaries, some, some of her, uh, some contemporaneous girls. Uh, of course, we have very little evidence of other girls around her age. But one in particular who is uh, an American, a white, was reading children's versions. Uh, this is a, a young girl who kept a diary. And so we know what she was reading. And she was also known to the uh, relatives of the Wheatleys. And so we have no evidence that she and Phyllis ever met. She was a couple of years older than Phyllis. But this young girl was reading uh, classics in children's versions. For example, a children's version of Gulliver's Travels. Meanwhile, Phyllis is reading Homer in Pope's translation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so she's reading adult books as a very young child. Uh, and as we talked about last time, the Wheatley family saw her as prodigy and saw her, they encouraged her because it made them look good. And well, in part because it made them look good. I'm, you know, I'm speculating as to their motivations, but certainly they're, they're promoting her uh, to others. They're, you know, giving her the, the opportunity to write. Uh, they're giving her the opportunity to meet other people. Susanna Wheatley is using used her own evangelical transatlantic network to connect Phyllis, the young Phyllis, to um, other writers and, and ultimately to her patron, the Countess of Huntington in, in London, in England. Right. Fascinating, thank you. Yeah, and, you know, uh, another couple of questions we think central to the uh, Phyllis Wheatley story. Can you tell us a little bit about her connection to George Washington and really what did she do to gain such notoriety? Well, by the time she wrote to George Washington, which was at the end of, well, October, 1775, she of course had already published her volume of poetry in 1773. So 
she was already the most famous person of African descent in the British Empire at that point. Now, still, it took a lot of nerve to write to General Washington, who was at the time camped in Cambridge outside of Boston, laying siege to Boston. Right. And she wrote to him, and, and she sent him a poem in praise of him as the uh, generalissimo of the American forces. And in effect, she's making it kind of what I, what I would call, in effect, making a claim to being the uh, proto -Amer uh, poet laureate of huh. the new country in the making. And she's, she writes to the person who is going to make that new country possible. <clears throat> Let me point out that uh, she, at this, when she wrote to him, she's the same age as Amanda Gorman, who delivered the inaugural poem for Joseph Joe Biden right. last month, and who uh, Amanda Gorman has identified as Phyllis Wheatley as one of her inspirations. Right. So, <clears throat> and George Washington wrote back to Phyllis Wheatley, in fact, and you know praised her, praised the poem that she'd sent him. He said, "Well, I, you know he." indicated to a friend that he had to be kind of modest about it because you know he's, he's writing to her about a poem praising him right. and in fact he invited her to visit him if she's ever in Cambridge at, at the time that she wrote to him send him the poem she had fled with uh, the people that she'd been living with to Providence Rhode Island because the British had occupied Boston right yeah, and you know, obviously this is the Warren Society, and I just wanted to point out, and a lot of people don't know this, to make this little circular connection here, is that when Warren was writing to the Second the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, he's actually requesting them to appoint a generalissimo and form a national army, and I think that's something that kind of gets lost. But you know, we talked about the little Warren connection the last time we spoke with you about the fact that he was the uh, Wheatley family physician for a couple of years, but but let's move on to Equiano now. And um, really, he's not a familiar household name. And you wrote that he called himself a citizen of the world, and that when he died in 1797, he was the wealthiest and most famous person of African descent in the Atlantic world. And so, can you give us a little background as to who this man was? Sure. Um, you say he's not not all that well known. He he's actually has interplanetary fame. There's a crater on Mercury that was named after him in 1976. So he, go, he goes beyond the transatlantic <laughs> reputation. But most of what we know about him, of course, comes from his autobiography, which he published in London in 1789. The interesting narrative of the life of Olauda Equiano or Gustavus Vasa, the African, <clears throat> written by himself. And, and all those words are very important, but you know, we could spend a lot of time on, on those, including the definite article, which uh, the African, <clears throat> it's his claim to speak, be speaking for more than just himself. And in that autobiography, he says that he was born in what is now uh, southeastern Nigeria, that he was born in Igbo land, <clears throat> and that he was born in uh, 1745, that he was kidnapped into slavery in uh, late uh, 1756, around yeah, 1756, brought to Barbados, was there for a few weeks then, taken to Virginia where he was bought by Michael Henry Pascal, who was then a Lieutenant on leave from the British Royal Navy, because it was during the period, <clears throat> one of those brief periods when Britain was not at war with France during the 18th century. Well, Pascal's almost immediately recalled to Britain because the Seven Years War, what in America, we refer to as the French and Indian War, was, was just starting up. So 
Equiano served with uh, Pascal on British ships throughout the Seven Years' War, which came to an end in 1762. Now, in the Royal Navy did not allow slaves on ships in the Royal Navy. So Pascal had to disguise uh, Equiano's status. Equiano, uh, and I should say, Pascal renamed him Gustavus Vassa, and which is the name that Equiano used in all of his legal documents, his will, his baptismal record, um, his, his naval record, when we do have his name on the naval record. And so he served with Pascal through the uh, Seven Years' War. At the near the end of 1762, Pascal promoted Equiano to able-bodied seaman. Uh, all this time, uh, Pascal has been pocketing the, the salary allotted for, for Equiano, of course. <clears throat> but he identifies him as an able-bodied seaman, apparently not realizing that this is going to make it a lot harder for him, for Pascal, to pocket Equiano's uh, salary. Equiano expected, assumed that Pascal would free him at the end of the Seven, <clears throat> the seven Years' War. Uh, he, uh, Equiano refers to Pascal as virtually a father figure, a substitute father figure. Pascal shocks him by saying, no, I'm not freeing you. In fact, he sells him into West Indian slavery, which enables uh, Equiano to make lots of observations about West Indian slavery, because while he was in the, uh, in the Royal Navy, uh, it's important to know that, you know, I, I'm often asked, well, how did they ever learn to read and write? In the Royal Navy, all the larger ships had schools because they all had a young boys who were in training to become officers. And these schools were open to anybody on the ship. Uh, one of the reasons that Equiano always speaks positively about his experiences in the Royal Navy is because it was as, about as close as a person of African descent in the 18th century would come to have being in, involved in an occupation that was open to all the talents. People in the Royal Navy didn't worry about what complexion you had if you're, if you're fighting next to them. They worried about whether you knew what you were doing <laughs> and you were gonna help them stay alive. And so Equiano tells us he took every advantage possible of learning things in the Royal Navy. And by the time he went, was sent to the West Indies, he did not get sent to, the plant, to a plantation. He was purchased by Robert King, who was a Quaker who was based in Philadelphia. King recognized that Equiano could read, write, uh, do computations. It would be a, a waste of uh, time, waste of money to have sent Equiano into the plantation. So <clears throat> he becomes effectively uh, King's business agent, King promised him that if he could save up the cost of that, uh, the, the amount of money that King had paid for him, he would free him, which he did in 1766. Uh, Equiano continued working for King as a freeman for about a year, then went to uh, England, uh, then spent several years roaming around the world on ships as a merchant man. And he was always restless. He spent, you know, I calculate that he spent more than half of his time at sea than half of his life at sea. And so he uh, went back to England, was um, eventually enrolled was well, enlisted as a seaman, able-bodied seaman on an Arctic voyage sponsored by the Royal Navy and sponsored by the, the government to try to find a Northeast passage over the Arctic to India, because at the time there was a, 
a lot of people believe that the Arctic wasn't frozen <laughs> and they discovered since they were in wooden boats, uh, they discovered that theory was wrong. <laughs> this led to a spiritual crisis in Equiano's life. Uh, so after they got back, he went around, he did church shopping, looking for a, a religion that he felt compatible. He was still doing cruises. On one of these cruises uh, to Cadiz, Spain, on 6 October 1774, he had his spiritual rebirth. The date I remember because it's my wife's uh, birthday, though hers was a few years later. <laughs> and so he has a spiritual rebirth. He uh, gets involved in an attempt to establish a plantation in Central America where he's hired to be the driver of the slaves. So he's, mm. he's not anti-slavery at this point, though he has been involved by this point, and we're talking the 1770s, mid 1770s, he's been involved in trying to free individual slaves, but he has, his attitude towards slavery is one that evolves. There is no, <laughs> unlike his spiritual uh, revolution that he, he, he undergoes where there's a specific date. We know this happened then. His attitude towards slavery evolves. So there's no particular date we can point to. But he quit the plantation in disgust, not at about its slavery. He says it's because he was disgusted with the lack of Christianity among his fellow well, among the whites that he was he was working with. And he uh, then goes back to England. He's still traveling around. He um, a applies to be sent as a missionary to Africa. He applies to the Bishop of London. Uh, doesn't get accepted. Of course, at this point, it's in the middle of the American Revolution. An event that he never talks about, by the way, the American Revolution, mm -hmm. which yeah. is sort of fascinating to me. But uh, and he has encounters with Granville Sharp, who we talked about in light of uh, in reference to Phyllis Wheatley, the, the great emancipationist and abolitionist. He eventually becomes. Um, he starts writing letters in the 1780s to the, in the newspapers, and he's writing book reviews, reviews of pro-slavery authors who he's attacking. Uh, for example, one James Tobin, uh, Equiano writes that the answer to the problem of, uh, of um, relationships between blacks and whites is intermarriage. Uh, which is something that, uh, you know, I like to say that he, he was hoping that he would cause apoplexy for uh, Tobin <clears throat> because Tobin was quite the racist. <laughs> so he, he gets on everybody's, um, you know, he, he, he's getting noticed, he's publishing, uh, he's in 1787, he's offered the position of commissary to help settle black loyalists who had fled from during the American Revolution, who had fled to the British side, <clears throat> to Canada, and then been brought, taken to, to Britain to settle in Sierra Leone. Uh, this is a high, you know, the highest position a person of African descent would have had in the British Empire. It was to be in effect the ambassador representing the British government to the local African political leaders he was soon released from that job by, uh, <clears throat> because of accusations from his white co-workers. Uh, one of the reasons that he tells us he published his autobiography was to vindicate his reputation, which was vindicated. The, the government uh, paid him back money, acknowledged that he had been wrongfully uh, fired. And he had been fired because he had complained that the whites who are also administering uh, this settlement plan were uh, mistreating 
the, the black settlers or the, the settlers as a whole. And so in 1788, his book was ready to go. Uh, we have a subscription um, appeal that he had sent to Josiah Wedgwood of Wedgwood Pottery fame. Uh, it didn't get published in 17, in late 1788, almost certainly because that's when King George III suffered his first really serious bout of madness. And <clears throat> George III didn't recover until February of 1789. In March 1789, Equiano published his autobiography, it was a bestseller. Uh, he was a brilliant businessman. He never sold his copyright. It went through nine editions uh, by 1794. Uh, he kept all the profits. Uh, he did, he's the first person who did uh, African descent, or actually anyone who did book tours. He, he went to Ireland, Sc uh, Scotland, Wales, throughout Britain selling his books. Um, and this is one of the reasons why he ended up as one of the wealthiest people, if not the wealthiest person of African descent in the British Empire. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, Vin, can you discuss the new evidence that seems to suggest that Equiano's accounts in the interesting narrative were fictional accounts as, as in not experienced, but rather invented? Well, one of the things I did, uh, this is the first uh, um, biography that I'd ever written. But before the biography, I edited his, his book. And I had never edited a, a book before. And I thought, having a mind of concrete, I figured, well, I should as the historians say, falsify everything he says. He's extremely uh, circumstantial. He gives lots of specific dates, places, names, people's names. And the Royal Navy kept records. They were as anally retentive then as any military organization is now. And I thought, well, I should check everything he says and see what, you know, what I can find out. And no one, people had written about Equiano before, but no one had bothered to look at his records or look at his, his naval records. And, you know, for example, he, he tells us when he arrived, that when he arrived in Falmouth, England for the first time, there was snow on the deck. Now, snow on the deck, snow in Falmouth, England is very rare because it's still warm by the tail end of the, of the Gulf Stream. I mean, pe people could actually grow potted palms outside. Oh. And, and so I decided to uh, find out, well, when did it snow in Falmouth, England? And of course, they didn't have a meteorological society, but there were people who kept their diaries and who noted when it snowed. And there was only one year that, the one winter that was plausible for Equiano's life by a minister in, near Falmouth who kept uh, records of weather. And he, he said that it was in the winter of 1754-55 that it snowed. And we know the name of the vessel that Equiano came from Virginia to Falmouth in because he tells us in the Industrious Bee. So I figured, okay, let me see, you know, when the industry, if I could find the record. Well, of course, I found the record of uh, the Industrious Bee arrived in, in uh, <clears throat> December 14th, 1754, which is years before Equiano says he arrived in England. And, and they, that's when it snowed. <laughs> and so, Going from that, then the, yeah. it was not surprising to discover that in the, in the Royal Naval Records, Equiano, under the name Gustavus Vasa, it starts to be entered in the Royal Naval Records as a servant on the ships in early 1755. 
um, he tells us the date that he was baptized in St. Margaret's Church, Westminster, which is a small church right next to Westminster Abbey, if you've been to London. Nobody had checked. I figured, okay, I should check. Well, and that record says Gustavus Vasa, a black, 12 years old, born in Carolina. And I thought, oh, Carolina's pretty far Western Africa um, with a little bit of water in between. And I thought, well, all right, this, might, this could be just a mistake, uh, you know, entered by his owners for who knows why they would say Carolina and because there are other baptismal records that identify people as being born in Africa, Gold Coast, for example. Um, <clears throat> so I kept, kept digging away and uh, the Arctic, the, the naval records for when he was on that Arctic voyage identify him as, now I misspelled the name, they said Gustavus Weston instead of Vasa, but names were misspelled all the time. And, and, and he's the only one who is listed on these muster lists for the Royal Naval ship that he was on, that he tells us he was on the racehorse. And he's identified as born in South Carolina um, at, at 28 years old, which was, this is 1773, so it's consistent with his 1745 birth year claim. And he's listed more than once on that. So the, these are the records that um, have gotten me physically threatened for having made them public <laughs> um, by some, some literary critics. And because a lot of people have uh, strong investments in, in his identity. You know, who he, he's a Nigerian national hero, for example. He's an African-American national hero. Um, and so different people have different vested interests. Right. In my attitude as well, uh, if the evidence is there, you have to make it known Definitely. and then let people deal with it. And you know, there's an argument to be made for why he would have invented an African identity if he did uh, at the time that he did, uh, because he knew and people were writing in the newspapers that what, what's needed is a first person account of the Middle Passage from Africa to the Americas. And one of the things that he's most famous for is the detail of his account of the Middle Passage. So and whether he got that from others, and he tells us that in all of his travels and when he spent time in, in London, he was interviewing Africans, people from uh, who had endured the Middle Passage. And he right. certainly knew that what the uh, movement needed was a first person account because there were whites who were attacking him who, uh, and who was uh, defending slavery, who were saying, well, if it was so bad, why don't we hear any accounts from these people who, who underwent it? Well, of course, most of the people who underwent the Middle Passage never had access to literacy, let alone to publishing. Uh, so, right. you know, it, it was sort of wide open for him. Yeah, That's I mean, you really make a great point and, and you highlight it. And, you know, but let me ask you this. So we know that in regard to raising himself up from poverty and obscurity, you've written that he was more of a self-made man than Benjamin Franklin and that rather than considering Equiano an African-American Franklin, we would more accurately call Franklin an Anglo-American Equiano. So how, how do you explain such a rise given the times and the fact that he was a former slave? Well, as, as I mentioned before, he had access to literacy and he, you know, he, like Phyllis Wheatley, was a child prodigy, clearly. Uh, he took every advantage he could of the opportunities before him. And so, and, and he was a hustler. Now, I've been, I've been, you know, called names for calling him a hustler. I mean, a hustler in the new, neutral sense in the same sense that Benjamin Franklin was a hustler, right. uh, that 
you know, he saw his opportunities and he seized them. Uh, he also did well, very well by doing good. Uh, that, you know, I, some people said, well, you know, you, you, you make so much of his, his having made money. I said, well, he had no problem with the idea of making money by serving a good cause. And he, you know, and these travels that he did on the book tours, and even before he was doing book tours, he was doing public speaking, public debates about uh, the slave trade. Uh, he was always, well, I'll give you an example of what I would what I offer as evidence that he was not simply in it for himself. One of the places he went to speak was, or he was planning to speak to sell copies of his book and to sell a new, a new edition of his book was Bristol, England. Now, Bristol, England, along with Liverpool, were the, they were the two major uh, ports for the, <clears throat> the uh, African slave trade. And so the they, African slave traders were amazingly uh, powerful in Bristol and uh, Liverpool. For example, when Thomas Clarkson, the white abolitionist, went to Bristol, he made sure he had basically an armed guard with him because it was so risky. And this was about the same time as Equiano. Equiano wrote to Josiah Wedgwood asking for Wedgwood's protection because Wedgwood had connections to the government. He, <clears throat> Wedgwood didn't get back to Equiano in time before Equiano went to Bristol. So he went to Bristol without protection. <clears throat> Afterwards, Wedgwood wrote to him and said, apologize. Oh, I was out of town. I didn't get your letter. You know, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I would have done whatever I could to help you, you know, to protect you because it was a, a dangerous thing to do. Uh, so, you know, he took risks for the cause. Yeah. Well, Vian, yeah. go ahead. Do you, a, you want to follow no, up? No, I just wanted to go back to that term hustle because I've heard people coin this term, the colonial hustle, because you pointed out last time when, when, when we were talking to you about Phyllis Wheatley and her husband that a lot of people did have, let's say, a second gig, whereas someone might be selling uh, goods or doing something else. So th this, this is true of a lot of colonial people that they didn't just dabble in one profession, but tried to earn income from many different sources. Is that not correct? Right. Well, what, yeah. what about Benjamin Franklin? Exactly. What, so, was his, yeah. what was his occupation? Right. Occupations. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to, to just piggyback on that term. So thank you for clarifying that. Excellent. Well, then you talked, you mentioned uh, Liverpool uh, being a major, major port for uh, the slave trade and slavery. And uh, we know that Bannister Tarleton's family uh, was huge into uh, the slave trade and slavery. So although there was an attempt to actually abolish the buying and selling of slaves throughout the British Empire through the Act of 1807, uh, really slavery and the slave trade were not officially abolished until 1834, many years after Equiano's death. And also, interestingly enough, the year after Bannister Tarleton, who was a champion of slavery, died. Can you speak about Equiano's impact, his actions as a staunch abolitionist, and how it had an impact upon the declaration of abolishing slavery years after he had died? Yeah. Well, uh, let me let me just qualify one thing about it. the 1807 was the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It, it didn't stop anyone from selling slaves right. in, illegally in in America, or right. you know, it was just what they what they hoped would be the first step towards mm -hmm. improving the condition of slaves if they if if new slaves uh, couldn't be brought in at cheaper prices the assumption was that the slaves in the new world would be better treated of course mm -hmm. they discovered this wasn't the case right, right. Uh, so 
uh, Equiano's legacy after uh, after his death, his interesting narrative was sold in various versions, uh, republished in various versions, and he was mentioned uh, certainly into the mid. Uh, 19th century, for example, William Lloyd Garrison mentions him in 1837 in the, in the Liberator. But in the decade or 20 years after uh, publication of uh, his interesting narrative in 1789, in the uh, though there was the abolition of the British transatlantic slave trade, there was pressure on France and um, other European countries to end their slave trade. And so Equiano's interesting narrative in various, uh, some really butchered versions were published in, uh, for example, in 1814, 1815. <laughs> Those were intended to pressure France to abolish its transatlantic slave trade. But uh, <clears throat> they were published in, in England and of course, during his lifetime, there were Dutch, um, German, and Russian translations of his book, Equiano's, and during Equiano's lifetime. So he's, he's still on people's um, radar, if you will, into the 19th mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Renaissance in the 1960s. And when there's, as part of the general renaissance of a rediscovery, if you will, of uh, writers of, all, of African descent. And it's in 1967, 68, that Paul Edwards, the, the great uh, pioneering scholar of Equiano studies published his edition of Equiano's writings and uh, all the research that he did that underlay that. And then it's sort of has taken off since that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I wanted to sh shift gears here a little bit. And one of the things I found really interesting was you talk about, well, your perspective about Equiano's book frontispiece, and you compare it with Phyllis Wheatley's and Ignacio Sancho's. Can you talk to us about that a little bit and your insight on that? Well, let me, I'll see if I can show you illustrations. Uh, Oops. Where is she? All right, I'll start with Phyllis Wheatley. Can you see her? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, you notice that she's very plainly dressed. She's she's dressed as a servant. She's identified as a servant. Uh, she's it looks as if she's musing before she writes something. There's a book in front of her. We don't know where that's supposed to be. Her book, this is the frontispiece to her a book that was published in mm -hmm. 1773. The artistry of the engraving of the frontispiece is you know, not the highest quality. You can see that with the perspective of the table. Right. And she's not looking at us. You know, she doesn't confront us directly. So that's that's Phyllis Wheatley, 1773, and which of course precedes uh, Equiano's frontispiece. The frontispiece to Sancho's letters that were published posthumously, published two years after his death. You see it behind me, directly behind me. Yeah, the Penguin that's, Classics. That's the uh, Thomas Gainsborough portrait of Sancho. <clears throat> Sancho, this was 1768. Sancho was a servant of the Duke of Montague. And the Duke had Sancho's painting, a portrait painted at the same time that the Duke had Gainsborough uh, paint his own and his wife's portrait. And so this was the model for the frontispiece of Sancho's posthumously published letters. And again, uh, he's not looking directly at us. It was, it was quite rare to have a 
uh, portrait of a person of African descent looking directly at us. Well, first of all, it was extraordinarily um, uh, unusual to have a frontispiece portrait of a person of African descent. <laughs> and it was, well, it was an extraordinary to have frontispiece portrait of anyone, any living author uh, for their uh, published book, because of course it raised the cost of the book. So if we look at Equiano's frontispiece, this is, mm -hmm over here. Right, right. You notice the way he's looking? Right, right at ahead. us. Yep. He's looking right at us. He's holding out a book. His finger is pointing to a passage in the book, uh, which is salvation is by faith alone, which emphasizes the fact that one of the main genres of his book, we think of him as a founder of the African <coughs> autobiography, a slave narrative, but he certainly thought of one of the principal genres that he was writing in was that of a spiritual autobiography. That's indicated in front of space. But you can see how uh, well designed that is if you compare it to uh, the Phyllis Wheatley. Yes. Dressed as a, a gentleman, mm -hmm. uh, he hired the artist who designed that frontispiece and the engraver who engraved it. Uh, we know this, both, both of them were subscribers to his book. His, when he first published his book in 1789, he had 311 subscribers. By 1794, he had well over a thousand subscribers that we know of, that right. we can identify. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the portraits are very important for self-representation. Uh, Phyllis, we don't know how much agency she exercised over the self, her own self-portrait. Sancho, of course, was dead by the time his became a frontispiece. But Equiano, we know, exercised, as he right. did about everything else with the production of his book, uh, he exercised basically complete control over mm -hmm. his frontispiece. Right. Yeah. Well, Vince, as uh, we wrap up this session, uh, you mentioned the Renaissance that began in the mid 20th century. And well, do you think that interest in Equiano will continue? Sure. It's, in the future? Uh, if anything, it'll grow. He's, he's a major figure in Britain. I do a lot of talks in Britain to uh, community groups, non-academic groups, and, and some to academic groups, but to, uh, he is part of the school curriculum in Britain. Uh, and he, of course, is uh, part of the school curriculum in Africa, in, in Nigeria. Uh, his uh, contribution to African-American literature is, you know, it, it's that solidly established as, as I mentioned before, as a pioneer in the um, African, uh, the African American slave narrative. He, he's the one who established many of the conventions of it, even though he probably would have been startled to be identified as uh, African American himself. Hmm. He didn't enjoy much of his experience in in the Americas, <clears throat> I mean, he, he would have seen himself as African British, primarily. Mm -hmm. You know, his book his book is dedicated to the members of the House of Lords, Lords and the House of Commons, which is <clears throat> not very American. Right. Uh, so he mm -hmm. is very much a, uh, an international figure, transatlantic figure, as I said early on, an interplanetary figure. Right. Right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, I mean, you know, I, I can't recommend both of your biographies enough. I, I think they're incredibly insightful. I think you did a really deep dive into the research. So we just wanted to thank you for making the time to join us again today. So um, 
and it's been a real pleasure to have you. So to our listeners, we've been talking with author Vin Coretta. Join us next time and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And on behalf of my colleague, Randy Flood and myself, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vin. Much appreciated. Thank you.